have any public comment for this meeting? None. So saying, we'll close the part of public comment. I'm going to change things a little bit. Uh, I know you were all asked to self-introduce, but because you're inevitably too modest, I thought I would do it and go around and also greet you and thank you. I'm sorry Greg isn't here. He planned to be, but I think he got held up with something. But um, anyway, to uh, introduce you, Bob, uh, uh, sorry, Brigitte Forcell is the so-called at-large resident. Brigitte, you may perhaps remember her husband, Gene, who was newscaster here for, I think it was Mr. Forever. KFWB or KYT, whatever it was. Yeah, forever. She was an, uh, an engineer and uh, has been really influential and helpful in the Riviera area and was head of the Riviera Association for years and now still on the board, I think, right? Still on the board. I come and go for some reason. <laughs> well, that's because you're valuable up there, so. Um, Steve House, architect. Um, and I, I should let you talk about your most loved projects, but I won't. <laughs> Has served the city before. You were on ABR at one point? I was point? on ABR for eight years and HLC for eight years. And in each of those positions, I was a liaison to the sign committee for most of that. Amazing that you're back volunteering for this, having it's done all that. From, from the media, Don Kadich, um, news director at uh, the News Press. If you get the News Press, you see his name every day, practically, and um, has been, to, to my mind, a key person in the media here in Santa Barbara. Um, Ken Opplinger. Three years now, head of the chamber, has, um, thanks to his shepherdship, what I want to say, uh, seen made it grow quite a good deal. Congratulations. Bob Hart is not Chris DePlizer. I don't want to be sure everybody understands that. We don't have impersonations here yet. But Krista couldn't be here, so Bob, thank you. Um, a very experienced realtor, broker, and now um, running the um, Association of Realtors. Having said all that, um, I'd like to suggest one thing that we change. We have, do we have any requests to speak on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Bob Cunningham, I apologize. Um, landscape architect, uh, years of service. You want to enumerate a little bit? Uh, nine years on ABR and uh, currently on the Street Tree Advisory Committee. Uh, for the Parks Division, and uh, been on the sign committee for more years than I can recall. Welcome, all you gluttons for punishment. Um, appreciate that you're doing this. It's a big job, and uh, just how big we're going to see from the staff presentation. And my suggestion, although it's on the agenda that we elect a chairman and a co chairman at this point, I think it might be smarter to see what our task really is going to be and then. If you still want to volunteer for that, you'll have a chance to. Having said that, can we turn it over to staff for presentation? Yeah, I'd be happy to be in. And with your uh, permission, I'm going to stay seated. This, uh, well, how I, are you most comfortable? OK, thank you. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish today is twofold. One, there is a degree of law that you need to know to understand the range of policy options you have. You're principally policy advisors to the Council and Ordinance Committee. But before you start making those kinds of decisions, Sorry, are you Mike? Okay. I'm, I'm on. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, before you start making those kinds of decisions, I want to give you an overview of, of the law. And the law has changed dramatically in the last year. And that's why this committee exists, principally. I will not drive into gory details on the law. It, I, I trust that everything I'm going to tell you is correct. It may not be complete, though. There are a lot of details. And depending on your appetite for it, you can contact me separately or ask me to report back on some of the details related to the law. Now, that's the first part of what we're going to do. The second part is uh, more important, frankly, and that is to look at the policies that, with the help of Jaime Denny and Dan Gullett, uh, 
who are respectively here from a design standpoint, Danny Enforcement and Dan Transportation. We're going to take a look at the policies that they've helped extract from the existing ordinance. I believe that a starting point for you might be to try and make this policy neutral. In other words, learn what the existing policies are and then try and build a new law that accomplishes those policies. Because as I read the sign ordinance and the regulations and the design regulations, a lot of what's there is very core Santa Barbara in the sense that it's part and parcel of design control, uh, El Pueblo Viejo, uh, and, and a number of other kind of core city issues. Let me interrupt one second. I apologize. I didn't introduce Ariel Colon, our city attorney. No. He's the driver on this and uh, has really got uh, the, it's important stuff. Thank you, Ariel. I apologize. Okay, with that, with that introduction, let's start with the uh, overview. These four bullets are what we want to try and accomplish tonight. Uh, let's talk about the goals. As I mentioned, the law changed dramatically about a year ago, and I brought this to the City Council in September of 2015 because if we don't get ahead of this, we will be on the wrong side of litigation. And the litigation in this context typically comes from outdoor advertising companies that see a First Amendment hole in the ordinance and try and drive a wedge into that hole to build a billboard or something like that. So it's an area where you need to be ahead. Secondly, I mentioned maintaining the existing uh, policies. And third, depending on your appetite, in innovating to, to deal with 21st century issues, uh, what those may be. Uh, the, the existing ordinance is uh, venerable, I guess I would say. It reflects a lot of 1980s law it, and policy. So there may be opportunities there for you to develop new policy approaches for issues we haven't dealt with. Uh, let me throw out some examples, or one example in particular. Um, uh, the law has developed quite a bit in the area of mobile advertising, mobile billboards and trailers that people haul through town and you may want to get into those kinds of issues, which are not currently covered in the ordinance. Okay, um, work plan. First, let's uh, learn the law and policy. Second, as I mentioned, extract the policy underpinnings. Third, before you get too far into this process, we will n notice and conduct a public hearing. We'll beat the bushes to try and get as many interested people here as possible and use that as an opportunity for you to uh, get educated about the public interests that are involved here. Finally, with staff help, we'll prepare a report and a draft ordinance to send back to the council and ordinance committee. Okay, let's talk about the history of sign regulation. It, it is a uh, very fresh area of the law in the sense that the, the uh, beginnings are recent of, of sign regulation, certainly 20th century. Really, we got started with Eisenhower's uh, freeway law, the interstate highway law in 1956 uh, facilitated the development of a 40,000-plus 40 40, mile interstate highway system. Not long after that, the federal government began to feel uh, protective, I guess, of, of the highways they'd built and were concerned about the effect of outdoor advertising on those highways and on the drivers on those highways. So by the late 50s, the federal government was actively trying to regulate billboards along highways. And they did that with a kind of standard uh, technique where they couldn't directly regulate the state and tell the state what to do. They offered an incentive in 1958 that if you uh, abided by the federal billboard regulations, you would get some extra money. And uh, uh, that, that technique uh, became available to the Congress in the 1930s after the court backing scheme where the Commerce Clause, the Congress's power to regulate interstate con commerce was dramatically expanded to include a range of regulation that no one had ever thought of. In the 30s, of course, it was uh, worker safety and worker welfare kinds of legislation. Uh, 
So that's on the federal side. On the state and local side, the, I picked a couple of cases that are really the uh, beginnings of this. Again, state and local regulation focused on outdoor, outdoor advertising, read billboards. So when I talk about outdoor advertising, you can substitute the word billboard safely. CUSAC, uh, it, it was an interesting ordinance in that it required big signs to have neighborhood consent. That was an issue in and of itself. The Supreme Court said that that was a valid exercise of Chicago's police power. Police power is something that the state and local governments have, not the federal government, and it is generally the power to protect the health, safety, and general welfare. So it's a very broad grant of authority to manage our communities in a way that protects the health and safety. 1932, Packer, Utah, perhaps not surprisingly, wanted to discourage tobacco use. They passed a law that kind of pre, uh, presages the 1970s tobacco uh, regulations that forbade tobacco billboards. It, it had a small allowance for signs in front of tobacco shops, but large advertising was forbidden. Their motives were the same you might have today to protect children from exposure to, to tobacco. And again, the US Supreme Court said that that was a fine exercise of the police power. Interestingly, this was not a First Amendment issue in the teens and in the 30s or even in the 50s. That developed much later. It is very much a First Amendment issue today, so I'm going to shift and start talking about um, first our city history and then the First Amendment. Long history here, early 20s sign ordinance, so put yourself in the context of Chicago forbidding billboards. It wasn't until 1926, to put it in context, that the Supreme Court clearly upheld the city's right to do zoning. So to sign ordinance in 1922 was very progressive and pushing the edge of local power. The, by 1960, the ABR got into it. Uh, again, the council recognizing that there was a design issue here that was very important and needed to be addressed. 77, the HLC with respect to EPV. The sign committee grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, and was substantially revised in scope in 2010. As I read the history of it, and you all may know better than I, uh, it was a kind of a streamlining budget saving move that led to some reconstruction of the, of the sign committee. So we've got a long history of sign regulation in Santa Barbara, it's nothing new. Let's talk about sign law, and I, I've called it the First Amendment awakening because that's really what happened. No one talked about signs in a First Amendment context until uh, very late. So how do we get there? This is the First Amendment. It proscribes Congress from inhibiting freedom of speech or freedom of the press. Congress. Well, the Constitution applies to Congress, right? How did we get the First Amendment extended to states? This is the, uh, I think, famous historically states' rights battle. The Supreme Court has characterized it as incorporation of the Bill of Rights as against the states. So 1868, the 14th Amendment came along, and that was generally a post-Civil War civil rights law that was meant to say to the states, you can't deny due process of law or equal protection or privileges and immunities to your residents the same as the federal government can't do that. It didn't say anything about the First Amendment. What happened, though, is by 1925, the US Supreme Court said that the due process portion of the 14th Amendment included First Amendment protections. So that's where the court started talking about things like the penumbra of rights and began really implying the existence of protective uh, features in the Constitution that applied to the states. This is where the right of privacy came up. This is the way that uh, the Supreme Court defined a jurisprudence related to women's reproductive rights. It was all applied to the states by way of the 14th Amendment. Interestingly, the early cases, uh, 1925, Gitlow, this, uh, uh, the 
there was a wing of the Socialist Party called the Left Wing, all right? And uh, I, I don't know if that's historic or not. But the left wing of the Socialist Party had uh, what uh, the court described as a communist manifesto, and that document advocated overthrow of the government. New York had a law uh, forbidding uh, that. Not uncommon that, that we've seen anti-sedition or, or, uh, or similar kinds of, of laws. There, the court upheld against a First Amendment challenge the state's right to regulate against people advocating for overthrow of the government. Makes sense. 1931, Stromberg, uh, again, another uh, kind of international workers of the world, wobbly Red Emma Goldman law. And this was where uh, the state had a law forbidding flying the red flag, which was known to be a communist uh, marker. And uh, California's law was struck down because merely flying the red flag, the court said, was just an expressive act. It didn't explicitly say overthrow the government. It didn't encourage violence or other kinds of wrongdoing. So by the 30s, 20s and 30s, we knew that the First Amendment applied to the states. That is still a live issue. As an aside, uh, Justice Thomas, who wrote the First Amendment case that we're reacting to with the sign committee, believes that the Establishment Clause relating to the prohibition on government establishing a particular religion does not apply to the states. So he, he does not accept that there has been full incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states by the 14th Amendment. So this is actually very much a live issue. Okay, First Amendment, what is speech? Uh, you'll see the quote up there from the Supreme Court. A lot of these cases grow up out of protest movements or other kinds of political advocacy. That's not coincidental. The court chooses which cases it wants to hear, and it waits, in many instances, for the facts that they want to use. So in the case of Clark, uh, again, it was a uh, political protest, and political speech has always been thought to be the most highly protected kind of speech under the First Amendment. So expression, whether oral or written, or symbolized by conduct. So we're talking now beyond words. We have seen the law develop to where the First Amendment limits the government's ability to tell me how to spend my money on political causes. Certainly that is not speech, but it is a derivative of speech, according to the Supreme Court. So speech is interpreted very broadly. And I need to say that because when we're talking about controlling where signs are and how big they are and the color they are, you, you kind of ask yourself, what does this have to do with speech? And the answer is it's expressive conduct. Now, what are some examples of speech that the courts dealt with? 1938, door-to-door uh, -door distribution of literature by Jehovah's Witnesses. The uh, city in that case had a regulation requiring a permit to do door-to-door -door distribution. The Jehovah's Witnesses are frequently mentioned or the subject of Supreme Court cases because, as I understand it, part of their doctrine requires proselytizing uh, of others. Uh, burning a draft card in 1968, black armbands to protest the Vietnam War in 1969, that's per speech. Hanging a flag upside down with a peace symbol to protest the invasion of Cambodia and the Kent State killings or shootings. Uh, speech, Hare Krishna sales of religious literature, speech, and by the way, that one's quite tricky and affects a lot of other areas we try and regulate because the courts have said that selling printed t-shirts is imbued with First Amendment protection as well. So we'll, we're not going to get into that, but put that in the back of your head. Sleeping in parks to protect homelessness and SOBs. SOBs is the lawyer shorthand for sexually oriented businesses. The expressive activity associated with an adult movie or, uh, I don't know what the word is, I'll call it exotic dancing, the, the court has recognized that those are First Amendment protected activities. There are ways to regulate them, but they are subject to First Amendment protection. So speech is very broad. Now, in the context of speech, what the Constitution is really worried about is censorship. So we're going to use a term called prior restraints. 
And prior restraints is just another way of saying censorship, and it means government pre-approval of your right to speak. So when the government uh, requires a permit for a parade, that is a pre-speech approval. It says, I can't talk without a government permit. The courts are very suspicious of that because it gives the government an opportunity to censor speech it doesn't want to have happen. And unfortunately, at least the cases the Supreme Court picked have often involved controversial speech. Should the Nazis be able to march through largely uh, Jewish Skokie, Illinois? Uh, those are the kinds of fact patterns that they've used to illustrate the breadth of the issues. Uh, as I mentioned, the courts have said that the prior restraints or censorship is the most serious and least tolerable infringement. Any system of prior restraints has a presumption against validity. And that is very important for our sign ordinance, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So keep in mind, whenever we want to permit somebody to speak, it might be a news rack, uh, it might be a parade, it might be a special event in a park, uh, we are running directly into First Amendment act, uh, protected activities, and we have to deal with them specially. Okay, let's overview the First Amendment a little bit more. The courts often talk about the forum that the speech is happening in, and that's because they have differentiated between the places people used to do political speech. Think uh, Boston Commons or something like that. Those are called traditional public forums, and modernly we're talking about parks, public streets, and sidewalks. You have a very, very broad constitutional right to speak on a public sidewalk. The city of Santa Barbara was involved in litigation a few years ago where the police tried to apply the penal code disturbing the speech law to a street preacher who was yelling with a megaphone in front of uh, what was borders. And that seems obviously enough to be a noise issue. The problem there, as far as the plaintiffs were concerned, was that the police were selectively choosing what kind of activity to enforce this noise law or disturbing the peace law against. So the city was sued, and we settled that by creating a detailed policy for enforcement of the disturbing the peace law, which is Penal Code 415. Now, a designated forum. What that means is that places that speech didn't always traditionally happen can be made to be traditional forums. And in the traditional forum, the strongest protection is applied for speech rights. So when you're dealing with the streets, whether it's a, uh, a sign, a street preacher, a parade, or a protest, you're, you apply the most strict constitutional requirement to the government's behavior. We are heavily restricted. A designated public forum has that same very strict regulation against the government. And that designated forums are places like theaters or meeting rooms where the city, for example, has allowed free speech to happen without any kind of intervention. A limited public forum is an area where the government has said only certain kinds of speech are allowed. So a good example for us is the city council chamber. When we were working on the council's rules of procedure last year, we put in regulations that limited the size of signs that people could bring into the city council chambers. And under the Brown Act, the purpose of being at a city council meeting is to petition for redress of grievances, another First Amendment value. So the council is able, if it were inclined, to limit the kinds of speech that happen in council chambers. How does this kind of issue come up? Again, through provocative behavior. There's a well-known case out of Santa Cruz where a member of the public insisted on giving a Nazi salute every time the mayor said something. They threw him out of the meeting, he sued, and we ended up with bad case law. Lastly, uh, we have non-public fora, and that uh, you see the examples, prison, military base, airport terminal. Typically, where forum analysis comes into place on signs is when we're talking about regulating signs uh, on the sides of buses or on bus shelters on the street, public property limitations. 
And so the courts have been pretty liberal in allowing the government to decide what kind of speech gets to go on the side of a bus or what kind of speech goes on the side of a bus shelter, okay? They're dealing with a, a limited public forum and the government can regulate there. For our purposes, again, almost everything we're gonna deal with is a traditional public forum because that's where signs tend to go. Okay, there is a concept of content neutrality in the First Amendment. And so the courts have recognized that it is not censorship in the sense that it is not an effort by the government to restrict what somebody says if the regulations are blind to the content of their message. So we built a lot of law, local government that is, built a lot of law along the idea that as long as we weren't restricting a person from saying a particular message, we could impose content neutral regulations on how they delivered that message. So the guy with a megaphone uh, on State Street, we're not, we don't care what he's saying, we care how loud it is, right? The, uh, uh, a sign regulation that limits the size of the sign doesn't care what's on that sign, it cares how big it is. It cares that the sign is safe, that it's not gonna fall over. We're not, in that instance, as government, trying to restrict what people say. Now, this is where the problem came up with the case Reed versus Town of Gilbert that we're dealing with from last year. We had built content neutrality around this, what I'm calling old view, that so long as the government's motives were pure in looking at the content categories, you were okay. Therefore, it was okay to parse up a sign ordinance on the basis of uh, election signs, real estate signs, construction signs, news racks. You were able to categorize based on arguably content, so long as the regulations didn't direct or forbid any of those categories of speakers from saying what they wanted to say. That's what we thought the law was until uh, June of last year. The new view uh, articulated by Justice Thomas is that any reference to content is unacceptable. What does that translate to? If you've got to read the sign to figure out whether it's legal, we have a problem. That's, that's the message here. If you need to understand the text or imagery on the sign to determine its legality, that is a prohibited government intervention in the content of what someone can say. That is a huge change in the law. You can speculate why the Supreme Court did that. Uh, I am loath to inject any politics into it, particularly because the Reed case uh, had uh, the vast majority of the court, uh, in fact, all of the court, supporting the outcome that the city or town of Gilbert's uh, sign ordinance was unconstitutional. And that cut across all of them from the left side of the court to the right side of the court. So I don't think there's a political motive there, but I would ask you to remember that dealing with the First Amendment cuts across areas beyond signs. So when the Supreme Court announced a very strict rule against regulating the content of what someone puts on a sign, they were also regulating the uh, rules that limit the content of what someone can say to you on the street. Can uh, the government legitimately regulate what an abortion protester says to a woman who is trying to enter a reproductive facility? We have an ordinance that regulates that. Can the government legitimately regulate what a panhandler says to you? We have an ordinance that regulates that. Can the government legitimately regulate what someone can sell or do or say on a card table on State Street. We've got an ordinance that deals with that. So when you're looking at Reed, and I do urge you to, to actually read that case, it's in the materials, uh, think in terms of the broader implications because the court generally is looking out years ahead when they, they uh, do something as dramatic as they did with Reed. My speculation is that they were primarily focused on campaign finance laws. Uh, 
I think Reed sets the stage for the ultimate determination that the government has no power to regulate campaign spending or, or donations. I think that's where we're headed. Okay. Uh, the old content neutrality, content neutrality analysis, I'm using the Renton case. Renton was uh, a uh, adult movie house case. And there, the theory developed that the government, while not being able to regulate what they did in the movie house, could regulate the so-called secondary effects of the movie house. And so uh, ordinances were developed that were essentially anti-red light district ordinances, and they were based on that theory. And there, the, what the court said is that as long as the regulations uh, are not justified based on the content of the speech, in other words, we're not saying that uh, a sign promoting uh, the Communist Party is more harmful than a sign promoting the Tea Party. As long as that judgment's not being made, you could categorize that way. So the court said, as long as the sign regula or speech regulations are justified without reference to the content of the speech, you're okay. And likewise, the harm that the courts found in the government doing that was that the, the government was then uh, selectively regulating people whose viewpoints it disagreed with. So backing into it, the court said, as long as you're not using your categorization of real estate signs or construction signs or election signs as a way to suppress viewpoints you disagree with, you can use them to categorize under the First Amendment. Let's contrast that to the new content neutrality analysis coming out of the Reed case. Well, the second red area up there says this common sense meaning of the phrase. I trust me that whenever the court says it's common sense, it means they're undoing 100 years of law because it's now common sense that there's another way to do it. And so the common sense meaning, meaning is that uh, when the regulation on its face, meaning when you can discern from the, the sign law itself that you have to read the sign, you've got a content-based regulation. The second, or the final area I have in red up there is really critical for sign ordinances because it says that the kinds of distinctions we draw in sign ordinances are more subtle defining regulated speech by its function or purpose. So when a sign ordinance distinguishes election signs from real estate signs, but doesn't tell you what you have to say on those signs, that categorization, according to Justice Thomas, is a subtle means of governing the function and purpose of that communication. So that sentence right there undid uh, almost 100 years of, of law. Now. Further, um, the court illustrated what it was talking about. In the Reed versus Town of Gilbert case, the, the town sign ordinance, uh, and they picked this case carefully, allowed uh, longer periods of time for posting temporary signs for uh, certain kinds of ideological or political signs than it did for religious signs. And that distinction, the court found offensive. And kind of for obvious reasons, if anything, why should religious signs not be able to be posted for the same amount of time as signs bearing other content? Okay, now does this mean that you're powerless to regulate signs or speech? The answer is no. If the regulations are content neutral, you can enact what are called time, place, and manner regulations time, when you can say it, place where you can say it, manner, how loud you can say it, for example. So time, place, and manner regulations have traditionally been okay. Uh, that's how we justified the uh, panhandling regulations. We didn't say you can't beg. We said if you want to beg, here's the time, place, and manner that you have to do it. You can't do it, for example, within 25 or 50 feet of an ATM. You can't do it with aggressive speech that puts a, a person in fear for their safety. Those were thought to be time, place, and manner regulations. 
Now, the distinction is important because there are different legal tests for content neutral, time, place, manner regulations, and content based regulations. And this is the, the hardest concept I'm gonna, gonna give you, so bear with me for the next couple of slides and it'll, it'll get easier. When uh, you are doing something that's content neutral, you have to meet what the courts have called intermediate scrutiny. That means that the court is going to use an intermediate standard to judge what the city council has done against the First Amendment. And that intermediate scrutiny uh, says that uh, the regulation has to be narrowly tailored. We'll talk about what that means. Significant governmental interest. We'll talk about what that means. And finally, that there are ample alternative channels of communication. So when the council recently amended the panhandling ordinance, we went through a lot of effort to make sure that there were plenty of areas on State Street and elsewhere where a person could beg without running afoul of the law. We identified plenty of alternative locations for that kind of communication. Now, that's intermediate scrutiny. Strict scrutiny is what the US Supreme Court said applied to the Town of Gilbert Ordinance and what I fear would apply to Santa Barbara's ordinance. It says that you don't need a significant interest, you have to have a compelling interest and the regulation has to be the least restrictive way of accomplishing that interest. The absolute least restrictive on speech. So let's put these side by side and try and walk through them. Content, content neutrality, which is what we thought we were doing with the sign ordinance, depends on significant or substantial government interest. An example, um, certainly we have a substantial interest in the aesthetics of El Pueblo Viejo. All right. A compelling interest, on the other hand, would be a demonstrated threat to public safety. All right. Not an imagined one, a demonstrated threat. On the intermediate scrutiny side for content neutral regulations, which is where we have to aim in the new ordinance, in my opinion, the, the law has to be narrowly tailored. It means only that the government regulation is a good way to get the job done. It's not the only way to get it jo the go job done. And I, I get there by contrasting the content-based test. For a content regulation, it has to be not a good way to get it done. It has to be the least restrictive, essentially the only way to get it done. So in the abortion buffer case a few years ago, McCullen v. Coakley out of Massachusetts, the court said that the government interest in protecting women going into uh, abortion clinics from uh, difficult speech by protesters was not compelling because there are less restrictive ways to protect those folks than by censoring speech. For example, you could have a law that forbade assault or battery against someone going into an abortion clinic. Uh, you could have a law in the case of a panhandler that forbids them from assaulting or, or battering, touching someone in an unwanted way. The problem we want, run into a, with local government is that a lot of those more direct laws are outside of our authority. We don't have the power under California law to regulate assault and battery. We have to turn to the penal code, and that means turning to the district attorney and the district attorney has its own agenda and funding for what it's going to enforce. So the practical reality of being pushed to the least restrictive means test is that local regulation becomes very, very difficult, if not impossible. And in all candor, that is why the court has that test. They are trying to stop you from regulating on the basis of content. Okay, uh, examples. The court did give some examples of content neutral regulation. Size, building materials, lighting, moving parts, portability. Okay, those were in Justice Thomas's opinion. But um, the court also recognized, and the area in red is important, they recognized that we might meet a compelling interest standard on sign regulations in some limited cases protecting the safety of pedestrians, drivers, and passengers, uh, 
those might be interests that are so compelling that you could justify a restriction on the content of a sign. Where that might come to play is the, the more adventurous cities have tried to defend real estate sign regulations on a traffic safety theory that they are important so that the drivers looking for an open house don't, uh, are not distracted by their, you know, GPS or whatever it is that would distract them and that the signs are an aid to that kind of travel. Uh, I don't know if that flies or not. All I'm pointing out is that Justice Thomas said that pedestrian, driver, and passenger safety could be a compelling government interest even after the Reed case. Okay, now we're going to jump to when the court really started regulating signs. I mentioned that we had those cases in 1917, 1925, 1932 that didn't deal with signs as a First Amendment issue. Uh, we had the 1950s interstate laws and we had the uh, uh, municipal laws that likewise didn't deal with signs on a First Amendment basis. The court didn't start talking about signs and the First Amendment until 1980 in the Central Hudson case. And the key message in Central Hudson was that commercial speech doesn't get as much protection as non-commercial speech. The court uh, drew a line distinguishing commercial speech from non-commercial speech. So. Uh, the government could regulate against misleading speech. Uh, it could regulate commercial speech if it's necessary for a substantial government interest, the same kind of test I described. So where did these cases come out of? Uh, pharmace pharmaceutical regulations, you know, drug advertising laws were addressed as uh, commercial regulations subject to an easier standard for the government to regulate. And then we got what the court described as the law of billboards in 1981. And this is important because the Metro Media case is really the basis for Santa Barbara's ordinance. It is the thinking that drove our ordinance. The court distinguished uh, commercial and non-commercial, oops, non-commercial speech as the, they had described a year earlier in the Central Hudson case. But they pointed out that commercial advertisements were really kind of a First Amendment afterthought. So when you're regulating, in the case of Metro Media, billboards, the city doesn't need to be real careful about how it does it. That you don't have to worry about content because commercial content is inherently less important than non-commercial content. The court recognized, again, that traffic safety and aesthetics were substantial government interests. I think that's still the law. But by 2015, that law was really turned upside down. And you have to wonder whether the easy path to regulation of commercial speech, billboards, signs for a business, gator boy on the side of uh, Cajun Kitchen, you have to wonder whether the path to regulating those is still as easy as it was when Santa Barbara conceived its sign ordinance. So read, again, facts are critical. Uh, church wanted to put up temporary signs for their services. Uh, we have this going on in Santa Barbara. The, uh, there's a church called Reality that sets up signs in front of the high school every uh, Sunday and apparently conducts its services there. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is notoriously liberal in, in a political sense, uh, upheld the town of Gilbert ordinance. It said, city, you have the power to regulate against this uh, uh, church's speech, essentially. The court reversed, and it's important to understand how the case divided up. Again, the liberal versus conservative distinction kind of went away. Uh, Justice Sotomayor, for example, joined Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia in saying the city ordinance was bad. Now, the second bullet up there, Justice Alito filed a concurring opinion, also joined by Kennedy and Sotomayor. What the concurring opinion does is say, 
there's really some additional reasoning that we want to add that Justice Thomas wouldn't accept. So even though we're a minority, we're going to express this reasoning because we're going to use that expression in future cases. All right? So the Alito concurring opinion is really critical, and we'll talk about it. Uh, Breyer filed an opinion concurring in the judgment. That means that he didn't accept any of Thomas's reasoning. He had a completely different way of getting to the conclusion that the sign ordinance was unconstitutional. Likewise, Kagan, Ginsburg, and uh, Breyer uh, didn't accept any of Justice's, Justice Thomas's re reasoning, but they did accept that the town ordinance was unconstitutional. So the way I count, that means the Supreme Court was unanimous that Gilbert's ordinance was unconstitutional. Now, Justice Alito, as I mentioned, um, did a lot to help. I showed you the slide earlier. I repeat it here to remind the context that it was the categorization of ideological speech, religious speech, commercial speech, real estate speech, election speech that the court found to be unconstitutional. What's interesting is Reed doesn't address or undo the commercial speech distinction that the court created in 1980. We'll circle back around to that at the end. I think that's going to be important for us. I think if you wanted to push the envelope, we could continue to distinguish commercial speech from non-commercial speech in certain ways. Now, back to Justice Alito, uh, he was trying to send out a signal to the sign committees and city attorneys of the world that don't despair. There's still a lot you can do. So municipalities are not powerless to enact and enforce reasonable sign regulations. And I'm going to give you a list. So in a rare move from a court, they didn't just tell you what you can't do. Justice Alito tried to tell us what we can do legally, in his opinion and in the opinion of uh, Justices Kennedy and Sotomayor. What can you do? Uh, we mentioned size. Uh, these are quotes, by the way. I didn't put quotation marks. Uh, Justice Alito said you can certainly regulate the size of the signs. And uh, you can distinguish among signs based on content neutral criteria. Okay, we'll get to that. You can regulate location. You can regulate lighted and unlighted signs differently. You can regulate moving copy signs differently. We generally, most cities don't like moving copy signs because they're ugly and distracting and a lot of reasons. You can distinguish sign rules from public and private property. Hot button to think about. Our ordinance allows real estate signs in the public right of way. On what basis do we forbid anybody else from putting a sign in the public right of way if you accept Justice Thomas argument that the content or the message on the sign is irrelevant. So by opening the right of way to private signage, we risk opening it to any kind of signage. And we're seeing that. Uh, not long after this case, the um, there's like a comic book or toy store up on Anapamu, West Anapamu, and they started, on weekends, they put signs up on all four corners on the poles uh, at the intersection of uh, State and A. So that, that uh, is, is already happening in, to some degree. You can distinguish commercial and residential rules, on-premises and off-premises. On-premises and off-premises is another way of saying billboards. Off-premises means that the sign is not located where the business is. So it's the Kentucky Fried Chicken billboard that says exit in six miles. That's, that's an off-premises sign. Uh, the number of signs per mile, that doesn't really affect us, but that's a reference to the federal highway laws that try and control how many billboards. Uh, nine's important because he did say that uh, the town of Gilbert could have enacted an ordinance that put time restrictions on one-time event signs. So you could say you can only put up temporary event signs within 12 hours of the event, or a day, or eight hours. But you can't distinguish between a religious event or a political event 
so you, you can restrict time. You just have to do it in a content neutral way. Um, obviously, we can regulate our own signs. That draws into question primarily two areas, and that's why uh, Dan is here, and also I've got information from Derek Bailey. One of the uh, larger handouts under tab four is the city's uh, parking and pedestrian wayfinding program. We will need, as we recraft this ordinance, to accommodate that program. And by accommodate, I mean allowing it explicitly and distinguishing that kind of government speech from, from private speech. OK, two more law things, and we'll get to the policy. Since Reed, a lot of things have happened that are very troubling. I've alluded to panhandling. It's off subject, but I'll tell you that the federal courts have really, really used Reed to beat up panhandling regulations. It's an issue that will be problematic. Uh, I've been working with lots of colleagues around the state. None of us quite know what to do with it. It's not something that I'm ready to, to tell the council, pull the plug, but it's something that uh, I am going to have to advise on in a pretty sophisticated way. But out of those uh, panhandling cases came law that affects signs. And so one of the first ones that came up was um, Omar, L.A. has uh, had a very uh, notorious, really, uh, program dealing with billboards. And uh, you may remember when uh, Carmen Trutanich was the city attorney, they did a large enforcement action primarily aimed at the side of building, uh, kind of, uh, I think of them as the signs. Remember in Blade Runner, they had those giant moving copy ads on the sides of buildings. That's what they were getting in L.A., in, in the 2010-ish. Uh, uh, so the city took a lot of actions to deal with that. Lamar is a follow-up on that. And what they concluded, this is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that was overruled by the Supreme Court. So you smell a little defiance in what they did in this Lamar case. They did say that you can ban billboards and that Reed doesn't address commercial signs. I think that's something we're going to have to take a chance on if we have any hope of preserving the sign regulations. We're going to have to, to do our best to come up with a rationale that defends distinctions between commercial signs and non-commercial signs if, if you want to uh, regulate uh, in, in a way that affects commercial signs differently. So what I'm saying is that the courts seem to be telling us that read doesn't affect commercial sign rules, that we still go back to Metro Media and Central Hudson. But that question is not free from doubt. And having the Ninth Circuit say it doesn't buy me a lot of confidence because the Ninth Circuit was overruled by the Supreme Court and Reed. And now, less than a year later, they are raising a particular finger to the Supreme Court and telling them what they think. Uh, Lamar, we also have Lone Star Security. This addresses quick question. The point since uh, bill, last slide, billboards can be banned completely. Right. Did you speak to that? Well, I, I believe that's our existing policy, and we talk about it as offsite advertising. Uh, so that kind of regulation is not content based. That uh, the sign is remote from the business doesn't implicate the content on that sign. Uh, I'm not sure I buy that, if you want to be really doctrinally pure with what Justice Thomas was saying. But that's what Lamar told us. They said that that off-site distinction is content neutral. So did Justice Alito, Justice Kennedy, and Justice Sotomayor. So we have three of the nine that say it's OK, plus the Ninth Circuit. So that's why I say I think you're going to have to gamble in some areas legally. Lone Star dealt with a state law that restricts mobile advertising. That state law was actually responsive to a West Hollywood ordinance that uh, was aimed at those um, driving trucks and trailers with signs on it. Uh, long story short, uh, you can regulate mobile signs. OK, let's talk about our ordinance, and we'll get out of the law for a minute. First, let's start with the structure of our ordinance. That's important to understand because 
Santa Barbara's ordinance is a very traditional ordinance in the sense that it was drafted post Metro Media and it follows the model that lots of city use, cities used. Now, first it includes extensive definitions and we'll, we'll talk about some of the important ones there. Secondly, it, it creates a system of a, requiring a permit, which is that kind of censorship, before you can put up certain kinds of signs, but then it creates a long, long, long list of signs that are exempt from the permit requirement. So what it's trying to do is get around the censorship job by telling people what kinds of signs are exempt fully from the ordinance. All right? The legal issues primarily arise in the definitions and in the exemptions because some of those appear to be content-based. The definitions, we have something called the civic event sign. Um, similar non-commercial organization, election signs. Clearly, that regulation depends on reading the sign to determine that it pertains to an election. Ground signs, uh, again, refers to advertising, not in general, but advertising goods manufactured, produced, or sold on the premises. All right, that, what if I wanted to put up a ground sign that said uh, vote for Trump? You know, can the government forbid that communication when it allows this kind of communication? All right, those are the kinds of questions that we're going to have to dig into. Definitions, logo signs with courtesy panels. Um, we are specifically there referring to brand names, trademarks, and logos. So uh, we, I watched a very long public discussion about whether Gator Boy on the side of Cajun Kitchen was advertising or art. The First Amendment does not want you making that decision. All right. Non-commercial signs, that is an important and probably still legal categorization if we accept Metro Media and Justice Alito's distinction between commercial and non-commercial. Exemptions, all right, here's where we really get into trouble. Uh, a temporary sign's okay if it warns of a construction hazard. Now, construction hazards sound a lot like safety. We probably can defend that on a compelling government interest standard. We have entities, and we will have an entity in Santa Barbara that is service providing and it's for profit. Mm -hmm. It has been, the, the property has been non profit and it's shifting to for profit. So I don't, I'm not clear on kind of how, how we look at if they want to put up a sign up to their very long driveway. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what the, uh, I'll, I'll jump ahead and I don't want to suggest this. I, I, I don't want to suggest solutions at this stage. What a lot of uh, people are doing or recommending is including in the sign ordinance something called a substitution clause. And that says any place a particular sign is permitted, you can put different copy on it and that's okay. So it, it eliminates the content-based assault on the ordinance by allowing people to substitute copy on the sign. So uh, that's a direction that we may want to head when we get there. Let's look at the exemptions because they worry me the most. Uh, temporary warning signs, maybe that's safety. Maybe we can pass compelling interest on that. Uh, construction signs. And this, the ordinance does something I don't like structurally. If you look at that second bullet up there, it's not only exempting temporary construction signs, it's also creating a regulation on the size and location of temporary construction signs. The definitional components should not be woven in with the exemptions. So we should have a definition and then regulation of size separately from putting it in the exemptions. It makes it tough 
that's an enforcement issue at the bottom line. Okay, what other kinds of exemptions? Uh, Non-commercial signs, but notice that we put a limitation on election signs that they can only be posted 90 days before the election or 10 days after. But I can post any other kind of non-commercial sign on my house, property, uh, as long as it's no larger than 24 square feet for as long as I want. All right? So we are disfavoring political speech here, according to Justice Thomas, anyway. Temporary signs related to fiesta solstice and official city holidays. We're giving an easier path. Can I just ask one question? Isn't a government interest in the proliferation of political signs? I, it, it, it is probably a substantial government interest for a content neutral regulation, but proliferation doesn't implicate a safety hazard unless we can prove that drivers are so distracted that they're crashing into poles. And, and that's one of the effects of the Reed case. The, uh, the council's heard this before. The old law used to be that the courts as a function of separation of powers did not inquire into the motives of the elected person, whether it's a congressperson or a city council member. Your private motives were irrelevant. What mattered was the statement of purposes and intents and facts in the law itself. That has changed. The federal courts are now readily inquiring into elected officials' motives. And more scary than that, they are doing it by inference. So there are two cases out of the Ninth Circuit that have been followed around the country. One case involving Newport Beach where the city council was trying to pass what looked like a facially neutral law regulating group homes. But the crowd and one of the council members at a private meeting had said basically, we're going to make sure that no drunks or drug users ever get to come into Newport Beach. So yes, this law is facially neutral, but it was designed and intended to uh, keep those people out. The other case, and there the Ninth Circuit said, we will infer that the city council had an improper motive based on what the crowd said. Second case that came up in more recently was in the city of Yuma, Arizona, and it involved a, an application for an affordable housing project in a relatively well-to-do neighborhood. The issue there was that the crowd in referring to those people or Mexicans was basically telling the city council, we don't want that kind of person in our neighborhood. The court again said, we will infer that that was the city council's motive. So what I've been advising the council case by case is that we now have an affirmative obligation to disclaim that kind of ugly speech publicly. It's very challenging for an elected official because it forces them to be directly confrontational with their constituents rather than just ignoring the ugly, stupid speech that we hear at every council meeting. So the courts have readily applied that after Reed to very closely look at the rationale for various First Amendment regulations. What does that mean? Uh, we used to be able to say that we think, uh, for example, uh, a sign is going to impact driver safety. Now the courts are saying, you can't do that unless you have evidence that shows that. So I've quipped that what the federal courts are doing now is insisting on a body count before we can enact a safety regulation that impacts constitutionally protected rights. So before you can regulate speech, you've got to show a body count. You've got to show that there's a real harm. And the, the level of federal court scrutiny into legislative matters is a related change in the law. The old law was that the courts did not engage in determining whether what you did was wise. They traditionally said the wisdom of the elected official is something for the voters to resolve on election day. That's not a court rule. There's a separation of judicial and legislative. 
and the voters are the ones that are supposed to monitor whether their electives are doing the right thing, not us. That's changing. The, the federal courts, at least, are rapidly uh, putting themselves in the council chair or the congressional chair and deciding whether that law is wise. I, I don't know whether, I'm not going to comment on whether that's good or bad, but it's right in our faces. And uh, we need to be aware of that as this law is created. Is okay. that at the Ninth Circuit? Uh, Both those Court cases are in the Ninth Circuit, but uh, in the context of homelessness-related regulations, both the First Circuit, which is Massachusetts, and the Seventh Circuit, which is Chicago, have gone that way, too. And there has not been a case to work its way up to the Supreme Court yet, so we're dealing with three of the uh, courts of appeal. Okay, exemptions. This is the one where we get into the real estate signs. Uh, we put in some uh, uh, special rules for EPV, some size rules. But then on open house signs, we draw a distinction between on-site open house signs and off-site. So we allow off-site open house signs. That's going to be a tough one to preserve without also allowing off-site signs that bear other kinds of messages. Keep that in mind. Maybe we'll figure out a way to deal with that. Uh, I want to help you with that because clearly the policy determination from the council is that those off-site real estate signs had a value uh, for the community. Okay, now we're going to shift to the part where you will need help from Jaime and Dan and Danny and your own wisdom, and that is the foundations of the sign ordinance, and there are three. There's a fact foundation, there's an intent foundation, and there's a policy foundation. So I've parsed those up. If you turn to uh, tab, uh, oh, let's see, which one? Tab five. What uh, you've got there is the sign ordinance on the left and then the extracted fact, intent, and policy statements on the right. I'm going to put them up on the screen. But um, So let's look at the fact foundation. The council concludes that the city has a reputation for beauty, historic architecture, and historic tradition. Other fair conclusions. There's nothing discriminatory about that. That's fine. Um, I question why we said we have a reputation for instead of saying we are. And what, uh, in other words, is the interest in the sign ordinance to protect our reputation or is it to protect the fact of our beauty and historic, historic character? So reputation is a weird word in that ordinance. Uh, strong visual impact on the community character and quality. That is an aesthetic issue, and that might have been good enough. It was good enough in 1980, 1981. I would uh, respectfully suggest that we need a much more detailed statement of the factual basis that we're using to regulate. So visual impact matters, but we want to say the reasons why signs have that strong visual impact. Likewise, signs attract or repel the viewing public. Um, so what? I mean, isn't that what communication's about? The, the last time I looked at it, uh, I have the right to say something you disagree with. Vehicular traffic safety, that's important. We will need to look for some data to back up that conclusion. I didn't know what that fifth bullet means. Sign suitability or appropriateness sets neighborhood tone. That really feels like uh, father or mother government telling me what's appropriate for me to display. So query whether that lives past town of Gilbert. Aesthetic impacts, certainly those are important. And here, the Council took the pain to connect the value of those aesthetic impacts on our tourism industry. We'll want to flesh that out as well. So those are the fact foundation 
foundations in the signed ordinance. Jaime, did you want to add anything on that? Um, well, I just wanted to emphasize that I think what I uh, learned from having worked with a lot of county committee members that they take uh, the fact that the city is unique as one of the primary factors in uh, conveying that uh, signage should be done differently would you be able to work the committee through why we're unique? Is it because uh, we have 89,642 people? Is it because we're near the beach? Is it because we have a freeway? You know, why are we unique? Well, I think the proliferation issue that I mentioned is that there was an emphasis to take down billboards and flag pole signs in the community, which was a noticeable change that occurred in the community. And that is, in fact, what makes us distinct from other communities where we don't emphasize the um, apparent nature of businesses by saying, I'm here, mm -hmm. come visit me here from the freeway or from any high point in the community. So that did have a, a very impactful Okay. Thing. So it's different driving down Reseda Boulevard than it is driving down yeah. State Street. Yeah. Could I uh, add something to that? It's always seemed to me a key uh, concept of the sign ordinance that signs are to identify the location of the business, not to advertise what's sold there, but this is where this business that you're looking for is, and nothing more. Phone number, that's the kind of stuff. That seems to me an important element. Okay, we'll build this list out a little more until we have to go on to the next meeting. Okay, uh, aesthetic impacts, we got that. Those are the facts. Now, here's the intent. The council's intent was to protect and enhance the historic and residential character and economic base. Does that statement represent a choice or is it we want to protect and enhance everything. Meaning, what is there in Santa Barbara besides historic and residential character and an economic base that we're not trying to protect and enhance? That statement is a good one, but it should be built out to encompass everything we're trying to do with sign regulation. We certainly, as Jaime said, we don't want pole signs. We don't want billboards because they are negative in the context of the historic and residential character of the community. Th this is the first time that this uh, committee has seen any of this, so we're not going to be taking action on any of these now, but just to take them into no, consideration. No, this is correct, uh, uh, Councilmember Hotchkiss. This is a, uh, a preview of the work that you'll need to do on the policy basis. And what I'm suggesting, and you, you'll see the agenda, it gives you an opportunity to disagree with this approach. What I'm suggesting is that you begin by ventilating the policies that you want to accomplish or things that you don't want the sign ordinance to do. And uh, examples, you know, um, should it matter whether the sign in front of my house says uh, vote for Joe or uh, peace. Now, does that does that make a difference to the city? Uh, that, that's that's what we're saying with these content-based distinctions. We're saying that we care about the message that somebody's communicating with a, a two-foot square sign on their on their front lawn. You know, and I I I, I want to challenge you all to really ask. Do we care about that, or should we care about that kind of content restriction? There's another angle we'll get to on political signs, but we're not, we're not there yet. Traffic safety is the other intent. The council wishes to uh, uh, improve traffic safety by minimizing driver distraction. I would uh, suggest that that can be beefed up. We're not just concerned with driver distraction. We're concerned with what happens when drivers get distracted. People die when drivers get distracted. And we have plenty of evidence of, of that from our traffic records. 
Okay, after intent, you get the policy, and these are uh, the shoulds. The, I, I often tell people that uh, you ask a lawyer what you can do, you don't ask a lawyer what you should do. That's for you guys to decide. So he, here are the council's should statements, the policies you're trying to achieve. So uh, the, the uh, uh, Mr. House identified business location identification. That's what the first bullet says. Uh, visual competition or excessive competition for visual attention. Um, why is it our policy not to subject citizens to that? It, it sounds like there is, a, and maybe there is, but it sounds like there's some kind of harmful psychological impact to me if I have to read too much. You know, and that, that I, I think I know what they were trying to say, but we'll want to articulate what does that really mean. Finally, harmony between signs and the rest of the built environment. That's certainly a legitimate aesthetic uh, program. I would add to this that we have a very strong interest in the safety of the sign structures themselves. So our, our ordinance, by regulating the size of signs, is also trying to make sure that we don't have big floppy things that fall over and hurt people. So we'll want to include that. So anyway, this is the, the uh, Ken? Sorry, I thought you just, uh, to, to, to go to the third bullet point, the signs that are coming out of these buildings, and the signs that are, you know, part of the discussion that, that went on when we were looking at the design science program was, trying to find the, the, that connection point there, wanting to be able to ensure that we, we provided clear signage, primarily for people who were new to the area, uh, so that it was easy to see and they could easily get to the destination, yet still have it um, you know, look aesthetically pleasing given the surroundings that it was put in. And, and I, I remember specifically as part of that conversation, the idea that if we have it blend too much, it defeats the purpose because then people can't find it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know mm -hmm. if, if we want to work that in there, but I think just specifically saying we want it to harmonize with buildings in the neighborhood, I don't think it really acknowledges the fact the signage is supposed to be easily seen and allow people to get to where they want to go. Right, right. And the other point you make that is part of why we are unusual, if not unique, is that we do have a lot of newcomers that don't know their way around, more than most cities. We're, we're a tourist destination, and somebody from Berlin coming to Santa Barbara has no clue where the mission is, right? So th there are distinctions that we can build based on the character of the community that you want to emphasize. What I'm saying with this handout, though, is this is all the sign ordinance says, and we've got to do a lot more than that as a foundation for defining uh, what, what you need to do. Uh, that's all I've got. I, I, I will mention uh, a couple of the other tabs. Um, and I said early on they were kind of extra credit. Uh, tab six is a, a set of um, little papers that give a, a, a maybe a more clear analysis of the legal issues than I have. So if you can read them, that'd be great. Uh, uh, surprisingly, the one that I really like a lot is the, the third one. It's the New York State Division of Local Government Services pamphlet on municipal control of signs. The writer does, a, or the author does a very good job of uh, fleshing out sign regulation in about three, four, five pages. So if you have time to read that, that would be really good, I think. And um, is that tab six also? Yeah, it is the uh, third document in tab six. It says municipal control signs. Right. Yeah, that, that's a very very nice little piece. And uh, the case, uh, the other thing I threw in are a couple of powerpoints from webinars that I attended, and. Um, they are useful because they're very concise, probably more than I've been and they will reinforce the, the boundaries of what you can do in a way that uh, uh, I, I can't do. So I'd urge you to take a look at the tab eight PowerPoints as well. And there are two. Um, now the other tab I, I, that um, is worth your attention is tab four. Tab four is our staff effort
to give you a comprehensive list of all the city sign regulations, all the things that touch on signs, and you'll want to get familiar with those over time. So uh, that's what I wanted to start with. Uh, what uh, we're saying is that the next meeting would uh, focus heavily on your view of what the policies and facts and intent ought to be. Uh, we would take that information as staff and flesh it out into a statement. And then the idea was that at the third meeting, you would test those policies against what the public has to say. Maybe you learn something new or different from the public. Maybe they have a, a critical point of view on what we've done. But it's a test that those policies make sense. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to hear comments from the committee if people have them. Go ahead. Any thoughts? Go ahead. We have, a lot of, have a lot of reading to do. Yeah. <laughs> Say that again? We have a lot of reading to do. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've uh, sort of made a hobby of reporting uh, sign violations around town for many, many years. That's as Steve, and I'm sure other people here. Uh, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see how you know, how we regulate ourselves in terms of what the revised ordinance turns out to be. Um, I, I, I guess when it comes to our sign ordinance, I'm a strict constructionist and, uh, and loathe to see uh, too many changes, you know, primarily that would result in the proliferation of signs uh, or the proliferation of information on signs or uh, the increase in square footages of signs. I, you know, I like our ordinance the way it is. I'm certainly open to uh, revising the ordinance to comply with the law. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is going to be an interesting process. Right. Any other thoughts? Regina, anything? Um, so much material. That needs to be digested. Thoughts here? Anybody? Do you have something, Deborah, you wanted to say? Go ahead, Deborah. Um, uh, we've got a question for you, Ariel. I, is there a community roughly our size that you think has <coughs> reacted to the new regulations or the new rulings out of the Supreme Court and read that uh, you think is a good model for us? No, and the reason I say that is all of the places that have adapted to read have done it through lawyer-driven processes, so they do not represent a community viewpoint. Now, to counter that, I'm not above stealing good ideas from other jurisdictions, so there are some angles they pursued. Uh, I'll throw out one just off the top of my head, uh, political signs, election signs. The way some places have dealt with that is, remember, time, place, manner is content neutral. You allow some extra signage in front of somebody's house during the 90 days before an election and the week after the election. So let's say normally you get a two-by-two two sign in front of your house anytime you want. During the election period, you could put up another mm -hmm. sign. And that has the effect of uh, limiting the signs because it's the rare bird who is going to leave up the vote for Joe sign for six years. So those, those are, that's Unless some of Joe. what... Hmm? <laughs> Unless it's Joe. Unless it's Joe. <laughs> so there is some learning. I'm happy to catalog that and bring it back to you. I mentioned the substitution clause that says that any place you can post a message, you can post another message. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that was in the uh, New York tab component mm -hmm. as far as the assignment. What about, um, I, I, I'm not familiar in specificity with the current ordinance here in the city, but as, as technology continues to usually leapfrog ordinances, mm -hmm. how is digital signage being dealt with? Well, we have a prohibition on signage that involves fainting copy or uh, scrolling copy. So the only exception the council made was um, uh, message boards on gasoline 
Uh, it says that in those locations, those are essentially locational restrictions, gas pumps. Uh, so uh, Plains All-American could plaster, uh, repeal the Petroleum or the Oil Products Act, or forgotten the name of it, all over their gas pumps if they wanted to. But a lot of what people are trying to do relies on the practical self-interest of the people putting up the sign so that it is the unusual situation where uh, it will be in the financial interest of someone to, to put other than commercial copy up on in that kind of location. There are other issues related to, for example, uh, drive-through signs and how you regulate those. Drive-throughs can are, you know, very difficult for some cities to to deal with. And you can imagine that if a regulation said you can only have a two-by-two two sign advertising the drive-through at the front corner of the property line adjacent to the right-of-way, that every business in town would put up a little sign at the front corner of their property by the driveway advertising something. So um, you try and deal with that with location and size restrictions to discourage it. There isn't a uniform fix that is content independent that I'm aware of or content neutral. I have a question. Sure. Sure. Ariel. Uh, are we going to go through our site, our ordinance, you know, line by line, and are you going to advise us regarding which lines we need to modify, strike, or? Uh, if you want, I was <laughs> hoping, I was hoping that you wouldn't need to burden yourself with that initially. What I was hoping is that you would define the policies that you want. We would look at the ordinance for the more difficult regulation. You'd say, keep that one. We've got to keep that one, figure out a way to do it. Or we don't have to keep that one. Then the staff and I would, with the help of a public hearing and some creativity, come back to you with a draft to, to let you check against the existing policy. So I, I don't think you need to get to that level of detail, but it, I can understand why you might want to. So um, you're saying we could tell you the intent and leave you to fulfill it? Uh, <laughs> Excuse me for interrupting. No, 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 I'm, I'm yes, but what you would get back from us would be a pretty detailed list of questions to answer. Did we handle this right? All right. Um, I was... Um, going to add to what Bob said, I also feel that the existing ordinance over the years has served us well. Um, so I'm wondering, have you kind of gone through the existing ordinance and identified what are the red flags that you think are going to run afoul of, of the Supreme Court? Yes, and that they're, they're in the slides, by and large. They're, they are in the definitions that are based on what the sign says and they are in the exemptions that are based on what the sign says. That's generally the process. The permitting scheme, I, I haven't gotten into that with you. There are rules for how a First Amendment permit has to work. There has to be um, a, a very prompt decision. So you can't have someone asking for a parade permit to, to protest Melania Trump's plagiarism you can't have them wait 30 days. Mm -hmm. You've got to deal with it within five days. And then there has to be a prompt appeal from that censor's decision. Uh, so there are lots of rules. Our ordinance is pretty good on the prior restraint process. Mm -hmm. So I didn't identify that. I said there are three things in the ordinance. There are definitions, uh, permits, and exemptions. And uh, on the permitting side, we're, we're pretty good. I don't think we need to change a lot there. Where we're going to get into trouble is, and where Jaime is going to be critical in explaining to all of us, is the, uh, as well as the ABR membership, is where the design bodies are feeling the pressure to get into content. And I keep harping on that Ga Gator Boy thing. That one petrified me, even though it was pre-read, because the, 
the last thing the First Amendment wants is us deciding whether something's art or an ad. That's no, just not a legitimate function. Great. Well, I just I would say that uh, there's a very long-standing tradition of regulating signs to uh, improve the aesthetic quality of viewing. That that is a really deep community value. And so this is a very dangerous process, I think. And I think you highlighted that. I, we would never choose to have this conversation if it weren't for this court case. Um, obviously, we have to do it. We will we'll get sued if we don't, and we'll end up losing and not defining the result in a way that is least impactful to us. But that is, this is so broad and fraught with um, damage to the city that I would say we should start you know, trying to craft an ordinance that is close to what we have today as possible. And I, and I don't even know how we would begin to do that. I think you need to, to start with that. Okay. I, and I, you know, I'd be curious to hear what other people have to say. There are obviously you know, the signs, the <laughs> realtor signs, political signs that are just low-hanging fruit that are going to really be a problem. Um, maybe isolate those and make those obvious as, as we're just going to make a call about those. But you know, my bias would be towards respecting the contract content neutrality and being res as restrictive as we possibly can. And that, you know, that is as close to where we are today as it seems like we would want to end up. And um, so th that would, uh, that's how I would see the best way for us to get to this quickly is for you to, to take, and there was even a reference in this document to something about not focusing on hypothetical problems, focus on real world practical problems that you encounter on a daily basis. Let's go through those, set those aside, see if we can take you know ninety percent of this off the table, and then deal with the naughty stuff that's left. I, I welcome the committee today or next time, saying the work plan I outlined it doesn't isn't right. We want to, and that's what Councilmember Hart is essentially saying. He's saying that if I hear you correctly, that it would be more efficient for you to see what we did by way of preserving the existing policies and, and work from there with some exceptional problems pointed out. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Do it. Oh, I concur with Bob and Greg. I'll make it simple that way. Good. Ken? Well, I mean, I've got a bit of a, uh, of uphill climb here because uh, folks like Bob and Steve have been living the sign ordinance for a while and I'm uh, going to have to get up to speed here. I, I guess I would only say that uh, from my perspective, I approach it much the same way as I think most others have uh, have mentioned. The idea here is that we want to try and and uh, um, you know and, and take this ordinance and, and do the minimal amount that we need to to ensure that it's going to meet constitutional scrutiny. Um, I mean, I, as I see it right now, just off the top of my head, the the limited areas where we're going to have issues is is it goes back towards the the court case. And so, if we, for instance, have in the current sign ordinance allowances for different sizes of signs based on content, we're going to have to come up with some way to deal with that. But outside of those sorts of things, I, I don't see this as a way that we're opening this up and taking a brand new look at how we're dealing with signs in town, at least from my perspective. So um, it'll be lots of fun reading. Bob? I, I probably am here representing the, uh, the group that's going to be most, has the most carve-outs in the existing sign ordinance, you know, the real estate industry. But, um, but as I look at things, saying, okay, we right now have a carve out saying you have open house signs, and that's content based. We know we can't do that. But I think it would probably be fairly easy to craft something that says a temporary directional sign, and that we make reference to that, and you can't have it out for more than four hours at a time. You can't have more than five of them. You know, just basically the same kinds of things that it would be in the ordinance now, but we just don't make reference to it as an open house sign. It's a temporary directional sign for anybody that's having a temporary event, unfortunately, you know, it's after they have the same rights, I guess, as, as the real estate signs do now. But there'd have to be something like that as the alternative. I'm, I get to wondering also then when it gets to the fixed signs, when someone is selling their home and has a for sale sign that they do leave up there on hopefully a matter of 20 or 30 days, but maybe some houses, you know, two or three years um, until they get their house sold, you know, and, and hopefully we're not going to take away any homeowner's rights of of having a sign in their yard to do that, but how do you do that without it being content-based? Therefore, someone can have a sign in front of their house always, as long as it meets a certain size and criteria. And I think that's probably the, the harder issue to deal with, I think, uh, from our carve-outs than it is on the temporary directional signs at the open house. 
Um, I had a, have a question for you. You mentioned about the one where at State and A they were putting up directional signs um, about their business. That was found to not be okay, wasn't it? E even under our current new laws, you could have a car that says you can't have a sign up for a long period of time or specifically in the downtown corridor. Because right now, we are not allowed to put open house signs on State Street, Chapala, or Anacapa from the freeway to Mitchell Terrena. That's, there's an ordinance that per, precludes directional signs right now, as I understand it, because I, I teach all of my members they can't do it. Um, so I'm assuming that's based on some law. I think a properly drawn ordinance could forbid commercial signage at certain locations on State Street. Yeah, and, it, and it basically it's a safety issue. There's too many pedestrians and not room for temporary directional signs. Um, and, and frankly, every real estate agent who has an open house would love to start at State Street. You know, it's like, well, let's go where all the traffic is and let's bring people up from there. But, um, you know, I think that those would be reasonable restrictions and we could live with those, we would support those, um, you know, to make sure we can still have open house signs to get people to the open houses and help them find them so they're not wandering around lost and help, you know, if, if all, any of you are selling your home, you would want the home buyers to be able to find your home. So hopefully we can we can come up with a solution that works for all that. Yeah, and I, I didn't mention it in the slideshow, but it, at the back of tab four is a bit of state law that applies. There's a civil code section 713 that says notwithstanding a local ordinance, a real property owner has a right to display for sale signs. So question whether that bit of state law is constitutional anymore. Uh, I'd prefer not to worry about that and to try and accommodate what state law wants, which is to allow property owners to be able to advertise their property for sale. Now, the second thing I wanted to say is if you allowed temporary directional signs, why isn't it uh, eat at Superica on the public right of way on Anapamu? Or, you know, that's that, or come to the war for whatever it is, pick your pick your uh, message. I would think you could craft it in such a way that it's a temporary directional sign for an, an event or so, something that it's, that it's only for a specific period of time. Maybe, I don't know, how would you put it up and say you can't put it up for super recovery for three hours if that's the limitation well, of time? One, one is, there is a difference. One is repetitive and one is incidental or eventful or event oriented. But I think we're getting a little bit into the weeds it's here. Too much, yeah. yeah. Um, but since I'm not going to be on the committee, I thought I should share a few you, things. You can them. come back. Do that. <laughs> Deborah? Thank you. I'm looking at the three overall goals, Ariel, that you have in slide three. Uh, the first is to revise the city's ordinance to satisfy the new First Amendment requirements. What I heard and what I would be supportive of as a process, uh, and I think it would be most time efficient, is for you and staff to... Um, you know, red line, revise uh, as recommended changes our ordinance. And then you said with maybe a list of questions, kind of discussion prompting questions, bring it back to us. It seems to me that would be the best use of, of everybody's time. And I would support that, that approach. Otherwise, it's, um, it's a very dense document to go through. And for each one of us to try to come up with our own recommended modifications, I think would be very time consuming. And um, you're probably in a better position professionally to help us help us guide us through that. As, as long as the committee recognizes the difference between an effort to make it legal, balanced with yes. what we can do with the policy staff, mm -hmm. recognizes the difference between that and your choice about the policy you want to implement. Yes. I, uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, what's going to happen, and why I'm somewhat hesitant is it'll be unavoidable for us to make some policy choices as we revise the ordinance. And it's hard then, technically, for me to make those policy choices explicit. So for example, I might decide that the way we wanna deal with residential signs is to allow a certain size sign within a certain distance of the right of way, uh, and that's it. Um, does that work? I might decide that on the political sign issue, we do like I mentioned, which was allow more signage before an election. 
You know, so there will be a bunch of assumptions. I can't do it in a way that I can guarantee is policy neutral. So basically, uh, what I hear you asking for is can you narrow the list of policy issues by beginning with a draft? And the answer is yes. It'll be tougher in the sense that you will be reactive then to us rather than the other way around. And that's not my comfort zone. Well, Ariel, if I could just, I just want to make sure I'm not miscommunicating what, what my thoughts were. So on that first bullet, which is to revise, to satisfy the new First Amendment requirements, that's where I think you and staff's professional assistance is so key. But now we get to maintain existing city sign regulation policies. Now we're on the policy side to the greatest extent possible. I would agree with that and sort of come from a do no harm position. Um, before I go to the third one and last one, which is the innovation comment that you have here, one of my own evolving uh, sort of approaches in land use planning around enforcement, because I've thought a lot about this in terms of being a planning commissioner, is that I, I'm looking ever more closely at trying to balance the, pr the prescribed, let's say, conditions of approval you know, or ordinance language policies, ordinance guidelines, with not overburdening city government and then the public having to pay for city government to enforce. Mm -hmm. So the more robust, we all know this, but I'm just kind of stating it kind of maybe as a starting point for more discussion, another meeting, the more robust we make, the more robust and narrowing actually, and, and with greater specificity, the do's and don'ts throughout this ordinance, it will require, and I think rightly so, the public will expect us to enforce those who are non-compliant. That puts us in a position then of having the resources to enforce. And so I just would be looking at a balance between how do we build in appropriate flexibility, you know, Okay. Let, I, oh, I, I yes. do want to respond to that. Okay. And it, it, I didn't know if you want me to just well, go on to the third this bullet is, point. It, it's important in terms of how we approach building a law. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to have laws that are simple to enforce. What's hard is to have laws that are fair. Uh, mm -hmm. When you look at uh, kind of jurisprudence in general, there is a continuum. And on the right side, it is if you steal a loaf of bread, you get your hand cut off. And we don't care why, uh, we don't care when, that's the law and that's the way it works. On the left side, we take into account lots of details around the individual situation that's involved. And that's very fair, but it's very expensive to adjudicate. So, for example, let's say we're deciding hypothetically whether somebody gets a uh, horseshoe-shaped driveway. Uh, we go through a very expensive process to assure fairness that that person gets their day in court, in this case in front of the council, on how that should come out. So remember that there is an unavoidable uh, polarity between certainty and inexpensive administration of justice and fairness. You, you, there's no way to get them both. Our American system has erred in favor of very, very fair application of the law. The result is it costs you millions to sentence somebody to death, as an extreme example, uh, or many ten, tens of millions even. So that that's something that, uh, you know, put in the back of your heads as you're uh, doing it. And that's why Danny was here. He's going to help with the enforcement side of it as well. But I can't give you both. Can't give you guess, certainty and fairness. So then lastly, it's this innovate to meet, uh, to anticipate and meet 21st century needs. And what comes to mind is with the way, the wayfinding work that's been done and with all of the online tools, I mean, internet-based, the personal device app opportunities, uh, I don't know if, if an assumption that we need all the signs that, you know, society has kind of, there's been a proliferation of physical signs until this point you know, um, in, in our technological evolution, I don't know that we and our community needs all those physical signs. Bob, with you know, all due respect to what's going on in the real estate industry, but um, but I think it's 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 we're at a good juncture, we're at an opportune juncture to maybe look more closely and justify the reduction of some types of signs, while 
uh, promoting, encouraging the advent of um, non-physical signs to help our visitors, for example, find and that, their way around. And that might be a function, an important function of the committee, because we have a lot of eyes up here and see things yeah, technologically but I think ways. that would help us also address the issue of which signs, the content, location, the size. Mm. I'm suggesting we not make an assumption, and probably we're not going to, that we need what we've had to date in the city, because I think there are other ways, especially in the downtown corridor or even down by the waterfront, I think there are other ways to communicate, especially for visitors to find activities of interest and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I think you. Don, is it done? Yes, thank you. Don, I think you wanted to say something. Thank you. Uh, obviously, uh, we're going through this process because what we have now, based on, I think, your opinion, is runs contrary to law. I, I'm not going to say that in public, but I think it's a worry. Yeah. Okay, a concern. And, and obviously, I think it, it's a good pr process for us to go through this and, and really look at uh, areas where the city is uh, vulnerable and in a way to obviously ensure that one of the unique components of the city of Santa Barbara is we don't restrict people's First Amendment rights. Um, recently, can you share with us or have there been any legitimate beefs with the city based on the ordinance of us restricting someone's free speech? Uh, well, I, I mentioned Gator Boy. That one worries me. I see there's some good conflict is there are some content-based restrictions based on not uh, conveying what's being sold within the store. That the business name is a prevalent uh, identifier for a, a commercial sign, yet there's a lot of people that want to identify what they sell and uh, continue to list that information so people know, oh, they, they have this product within the store. And yet our signs ordinance has tried to uh, limit that, especially type signage. Um, that's one point. And then the innovation of websites, whether websites should be part of signage and uh, visibly displayed. And so we are having that con those two conflicts. I think Natalie, as our chair, she, she's been the person that comes back up to say no and carries the bill back to the city. Okay. Um, well, I admit my bias is uh, along what Bob and Brigitte and others have said that to, we, we had it, we spent years doing this and we had something good and now the, to some degree the rug may be being pulled out from underneath us, so we want to get it back underneath in a way that's, that works. Um, if we don't do it right, we could have real problems with the city. I mean, we have a very particular special city, and it's, at least by first glance, it, it may be difficult to preserve that, but we certainly should try. I would have to say that I think this is a really bright body of people and uh, the right choices for people to be here. But it's going to take a real commitment on your part, witness the size of this thing, to um, make it happen. Uh, we have a couple of business things that we should do one of which is to decide when we want, how much time we want to give ourselves for a future date before we meet again, because I think we all need to look at this pretty carefully. And secondly, to elect a chair and a vice chair. Um, in, uh, in that regard, let's go with that one first, and I'll open the, the uh, floor to suggestions and nominations. I know I'm a bright pot. She does. <laughs> second. Did you say second? I did. Sorry. <laughs> We'll have to talk. <laughs> hey, can we have some other nominations, please? Do we have a second? We got to go through with it. <laughs> All right. So we have, I think, one nomination. I guess I can run this, even though it's me. But all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> I'm going to remember this, I'll tell you. <laughs> Secondly, how much time? Do we want a vice chair? Yeah, we do. I, I, I nominate Greg Hart. Yeah, I, sec I can't, I shouldn't second it. Uh, I'll second that. <laughs> uh, Ms. Lodge for a second it, so. Um, any other nominations? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> 
<laughs> no opposition. Congratulations. All right. Last th last thing I think we need to deci decide is um, when we want to meet again. Correct, sir. And uh, I would like you to confirm that you want us to bring back a draft product. Um, that would be good to hear from a committee on. Greg, could you elaborate on what you said? Because yeah, I, I thought it was I'm good. Thinking, I don't know if you need to go all the way to you know the draft language, but I think it's important to shrink the range of the conversation and to really just bring it down to, you know, here's where you have to make a policy decision, left or right, on the road. Um, there's, it's just too big. It's too compre too too overwhelming, and um, you know, and I think it just makes everybody nervous that we're going to upset what we've done to date. They're really, where are these places where the content neutral rub is most apparent? You know, for example, I think you said commercial signs are okay to regulate, and so if that's the case, we can take a lot of stress off this and just say what we're doing with commercial signs today is fine. And then now we're talking just about, you know, political speech, um, directional signage, temporary directional signage. Um, I can't even think of what the other ones are, but if it's just literally those few, just let's just come back and chew on those. And, um, you know, as somebody who has to put signs up in elections and stuff, frankly, it's a big pain. I, you know, we don't even need to do political signs. Lots of, it isn't smart politics to do it. You just do it because everybody has to do it. So you ask so, us to outlaw it then? Is that what I, I, I would do that. I don't know if Frank would agree, but honestly, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> I'm termed out. I, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> no signs uh, at all. We'll all right. Just, uh, well, let's get into that, though. So do you have the direction you need? I think so. Okay. I, I, I think he's that correct. Helpful? Is that, is that Yeah, yeah, I understand. It, it, yeah. And, and you, yes, I understand. You want to narrow what you've got to confront. Yeah. Yeah. Frank, can I ask a question on oh, clarifying? Please. Just for clarity on the, on the commercial versus not. So as an example, all of our real estate signs I would classify as a commercial sign. But if you can say we're given the right to put up a commercial sign to do something, but someone who's doing a non-commercial venture is not allowed to do that, my understanding would probably be that you could be more restrictive on commercial, but not necessarily less. Would that be a correct assumption? That is precisely right. I didn't get into it. There's a case called Metro Media 2, and it dealt with the obligation not to limit non-commercial signs in the same manner you limit commercial signs. So some of our regulations now on commercial signs might be allowing certain things in commercial rather than restricting commercial. Therefore, we would have to look at those. Yeah, I think yours is the hardest thing of all. It opens the door I to I know. That's why I'm so glad I'm not actually problems. here. And, I'm, and I'm, I'll just be honest and <laughs> cut the chase Christa. short. Is, you <laughs> know, I, I, I think the community here. values are that the, if, if that is the wedge that opens the door to massive signage in the community, I, I would think the community would have, will speak really clearly and say that's not okay. Yeah. So I think this is a hard thing. I don't know what the answer is, but I, I see the problem for your specific need. Yeah, we do too. And, and we're, we're so glad to be at the table. Yeah, you know, and because because we, we need to be, we want to help find a solution. That's why we're saying it's like, well, if we can help come up with something with a time limitation on a temporary directional sign rather than calling it a real estate open house sign, then mm -hmm. let's come up with something like that. And we, you know, we can sell it to our members if it makes sense and it allows them to continue doing business rather than saying you can't do business because of some new government regulation. Well, but it is the reality is what it is. I know, and, and it's, right. I don't. Th I would never. I don't think it would be fair to characterize it the way you did ever. I think it would be a characterization of, in order for us to do business the way we have always done business, we have to allow signs exactly like this all over the city. That's a different conversation. That's a different yeah. question. And I think that's really what we're facing, yep. not the way you described it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, if I could help share a couple things. Uh, what I heard Ariel say today was uh, this is a good group in the community that could help shape um, our um, message and goals, the purpose and intent question that needs to be enhanced. So I, I would challenge you that I'll work with uh, the city attorney to help uh, focus in on this area. I think you can do some good work there. That I think it's your job to come back and look at that purpose and intent and try to enhance that mm -hmm. and to achieve the goals and objectives that I think Ari is saying yeah. you need some additional help. So we don't want to create collaboration to be able to 
Looking down the line, I think to some degree I have to turn to you to say how much time do you need before we meet again? Two months. All right. And can I ask that uh, whatever you're going to bring forward, you give to us at least a week in advance, maybe two weeks? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's going to require considerable fermentation and, you know, a, a close look. As long as, yes, that's, I'm happy to do that and will do that. It, in, as long as we're going to be drafting something, I'd like to throw out uh, three, I don't know if they're innovations, but they're realities in a lot of cities that where I want to see whether you would like to examine what it looks like going there. One, mobile signs, the trucks and the, the trailers. Uh, two, um, what, for lack of a better word, I'd call a twirler, the humans with the Domino's pizza sign or whatever it is. Uh, that's a big issue in a lot of places. And then third, uh, foreign language copy signs. Um, there is a, a, the San Gabriel Valley has had a lot of issues with foreign language signs. And the, the question crosses aesthetic and uh, uh, safety issues. It's kind of a social issue. So those are three emergent areas that I, I have seen out there. I don't have any particular desire to get into them. I just mentioned that as things to put in the back of your head. There's inflatable signs, too. I think we cover those. No, no, okay. Yeah, we cover those. They are fixed. Well, mobile uh -huh. trucks are off-premises signs. Are well, there is, yeah, there's a truck on De La Vina Street that's yeah. pretty much there every day, all day. Obviously, we got the right people on this co committee. All right, so it's five after seven. Um, let's look at the, if you look at your calendar, we're talking three months, it'd be October, I believe. Two. Just two months? I'm away. So September we could do it in September? Third. Well, I'm away the second through the 23rd. Yeah. Of September? Yeah. Okay, so after the 23rd, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that okay for other people? Mm -hmm. Say it again, please. 27th of September. Uh, okay. Can you maybe make it early to mid-October? Yeah, Chair Hotchkiss, I wouldn't argue with October 13th. I think we have this room most Thursday evening, so All I'd right. like to stick to a Thursday if possible. And the 13th would be... We could do a lot of work for you in that time frame. Is that uh, a date possible for others here? Yeah. Are we talking yeah. evenings? That's a Thursday again? Yeah, five or we, oh, we could make it six if you want. What? We, I, we could do five or six, whichever you want, or well, earlier. Well, it's a co planning commission day, so. Six? All right. We're asking or 5 a lot of. Or 5.30 I don't know, Sheila, what do you think? Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't know right now what we have on that date, but 6 would be safe, but I don't know if that's too much of a lag for folks that are getting off at 5 o'clock. What's your preference? Yeah, could you limit that PC agenda that day? We got the, yeah, we got the power here. All right. So let's do, can we try 5 on the, on the uh, October 13th? Is that all, satisfactory all around? Yeah. Not perfect, but it's okay. Okay. And I guess specifically to those three things that you mentioned, I, I think I'm I'm hearing the bias from this group, and if I'm wrong, everybody somebody say something, is no to any of those new things. I think that we don't if they're not in the ordinance now, that we don't let them happen. I don't think anybody's looking for more signs. So the uh, twirlers, the language signs, the um, yeah. other things. There you go. They're here. They're already here. Yeah. So you're saying no, I don't think we should change the ordinance to allow them to happen. But they're definitely here. Yeah. So I think they need to be addressed in the new ordinance. No, no, I wasn't suggesting allowing them. I was trying to restrict them. Yeah. Yes. We okay. need to address yeah. them. That's what I, okay. I, I got it. I think yeah. something that, that you and Frank in particular are going to have to keep in mind is whatever we do, if we can't enforce it, it's worthless. And right now, we're not enforcing our time. No. Well, the reality is we don't have any money to do any of this stuff, and there that's just the reality. So. Okay. Not change, so. <laughs> just one thing on the foreign language signs, that's content-based, is it not? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be a violation of the First Amendment if we are restricting foreign language signs? Just There's quite a bit of pre-read case law that addresses it. I'm not 
I think it's a thorny area to deal with because of the social and cultural implications. So I'm not advocating for it, but some cities have tried to deal with it. Well, in the San Gabriel Valley, it may have been a whole area for Chinese, for instance, where uh, that was important. Whatever. If, if, I mean, if I understand the desire to sort of look at things that might be coming up, but if our if our if our idea here is we want to, as we said, sort of keep things as much as we can the way they are, except to deal with the constitutional <laughs> issues. If we're going to start opening up other things because we want to be more strictive in other areas that aren't dealt with this constitutional question, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we could bring in here that I don't think we want to cross. So I would just prefer we stick to the real reason we're here. That seems reasonable to me. Is there anything else, or may we adjourn? Um, with permission, I'll take Howard Wittosh's binder and hand it over to him and give the full length on that. Chart. Good. Give the lengthy briefing. Mm -hmm. Thank that, you. This, this is a very valuable briefing, and, and I'm sure you'll be very hearing well done. Mr. Kalan, do you have anything more? No, leave your signs and take your binders, please. And thank you very much for the extensive work you did. We're adjourned. Thank you.